With me today, I have the editorial director of Nine Marks, Jonathan Lehman, just hot off of teaching a class on church membership and church discipline to the radio students. Thank Which was you. so fun. Really? What great students they seem to be. In conversations outside, uh, beforehand, the good questions they're asking throughout, sharp, thoughtful people. Thank you for the chance to uh, teach them. Yeah, well, the... Church discipline part was worth its weight in gold. That statement at the very beginning, just what your church that you are planning has in common with the historic church is the most yeah, important that's right. thing about it. That was very, very helpful. So glad you could be here. Glad Thank you, you could bring your wife. This is oh, awesome. so fun. Yeah, I'm glad our wives are hanging out there together. A couple questions. Just mm -hmm. want to get some stuff out there for pastors and potential people who want to head to the field, church planters. Um, Let's talk about the church just really quickly. Why is ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, why is that important for missionaries heading overseas? Why is that something that should be primary, one of the main things that they have in their tool belt, in their backpack as they head overseas? In some way, the question is part of the problem. Uh, the question indicates that many evangelical, evangelicals today don't recognize how the Christianity is the church life. Amen. Right? Um, your question, why do they need to know ecclesiology? It's kind of like asking a construction crew who's going to go over to Budapest and build buildings, why, do your, why does your construction crew need to know how to do construction? You're a football coach going over to start a new program in Zambia, American football. Why, why does your football coach need to, to understand football? Because mm -hmm. that's what it is. That's what they're there to do, right? Mm -hmm. With that construction crew, with that football coach, with those church planners, missionaries. So I think of I think of First Peter two ten. Once you were not a people, now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Typically, we think about the gospel as not have mercy, declare the mercy of God. People come into a knowledge of God's mercy. That's conversion. But notice what Peter parallels with that line. Once you were not a people, now you are a people. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, conversion is corporate. Yeah. Which is to say becoming a Christian means signing up for a family photograph. Which is to say those people bringing the gospel, if they're doing it right, mm -hmm. are also bringing the church. Why do you need ecclesiology? Because that's what you're bringing. You are bringing the good news of God's work and salvation in creating a people yeah. for himself to the praise of his glorious grace. So how do we identify those people? Who are they? What obligations do they have to each other? How do they guard and protect the gospel? Hmm. How does leadership work? How do you draw the line between the inside and the outside? How do you practice church discipline? What is church membership? Is it really in the Bible? Okay, what does baptism and the supper have to do with all of this? Yeah. Is that like somehow just arbitrary things, or the acts of grace that we receive? Okay, all of this is part and parcel of making disciples Amen. and drawing them into covenanted assemblies together hmm. so yeah this is this is central to a missionary's work so guys who would take matthew 28 19 and say i don't see church in there i see go and make disciples yeah. and usually they leave off 20 and teaching them to obey all that i've made sure they would that you read would that say text that. in isolation yeah they, no, they do, yeah. They, they, they read that text in isolation. Whereas if you're paying attention to Matthew's gospel as a whole, mm. and you're reading it in context of Matthew 16 and 18, as Matthew and Jesus tells you you should, you'll understand that that's a text for planting churches. Yeah. W what am I looking at? Well, I, I think Matthew creates at least, or Jesus gives us at least three textual links between 16, 18, and 20. First of all, the, the textual link of heaven and earth language. So think 16 and 18. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Yeah. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Right? You see a textual link in the language of in the name, where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am among them. Okay, Matthew 18, verse 20. And then, Matthew 28, baptize into the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Who has the authority to baptize into the name? Well, presumably it's those who gather in the name. Mm. Third textual link, language of presence. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. That is to say, not that he's hovering like a mystical fog in the room. Right. That is to say, they represent me. They speak for me. They bind and loose on my behalf. Right? And there I am. And then, Matthew 28, 
teaching them everything uh, to obey everything I've commanded, mm -hmm. and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Right. So Matthew, as a gospel writer, is telling us to read chapter 28 in context of Matthew 16 and 18, which is to say they are church planting texts. And this is not a new idea. Right. This, this is how the church has read that historically. And throughout the New Testament, what do you see? You see the apostles going and planting churches. That's just what they do. Mm -hmm. And Christians in the New Testament are all part of churches. Yep. So they were looking at it, and they were seeing Matthew 28 as a church planting text. Mm -hmm. Whether or not some people in the 20th century, 21st century can or can't see that. It's there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we see churches being the goal of yeah. what, the mission, what the Great Commission is the about. The means and the goal. The means and the goal the object of the Great Commission, to see right. these churches planted. Why in missions today do we see such an emphasis? This is generally what we're seeing down at Radius, as we have different agencies, even churches that send us their members on occasion to train them up and to send them to the field. There's an emphasis on let's get this done as quickly as possible because we have a lot of people out there dying and going to hell. We need to get these churches planted as fast as possible. And it tends to produce something that maybe is a little different than what we're seeing biblically prescribed as a church. There, there's things in there, whether that's unbelievers as part of a church, two or three are gathered together, all of a sudden then we're a church and we have there's no foundation to that. Where do you think this is coming from? Why is missions speed kind of one of the, the animating factors in missions today? Yeah, uh, several things. Number one, urgency is good. Mm. People are dying and going to hell. There, sh there should be a burden in our, a, a burden of urgency in our hearts to share mm. the gospel with people. So yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to diminish at all that sense of urgency yeah. that people feel. What, 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 what I push back against, however, is zeal, urgency without knowledge, mm. without wisdom. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, what I would push back against is a kind of short-term thinking mm. that characterizes pragmatic, individualistic evangelicals. What I would push back against is a lack of ecclesiology. That is just characteristic of evangelicals in the American context for the last 50, 60, 70 years, and a failure to recognize this long, slow, careful work of planting churches is actually better for the church and the witness and reaching people in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can get my kids energetic and hyper right now by giving them a lot of sugar, how long is that going to last? Mm. And there's kind of a adrenaline rush, sugar-giving impulse in evangelicals. we got to do whatever we can this Sunday to get as many people as possible. Mm. But the problem along the way is we're not paying attention to our Bibles and what they say about the good of long-term work that actually lasts. And that's where we look to Jesus and the apostles and the fact that they established churches, right? Mm. So there's just a short-term individualistic pragmatism which prevails in American churches, mm. first of all, and so that's what you see across the American landscape, right? And the trouble is you then export what you manufacture. So if I'm manufacturing consumeristic, individualistic, short-term thinking churches here, mm. what are my intuitions going to be if I've grown up inside of those churches? They're, they're going to be those same kinds of intuitions, yep. and I'm going to go overseas and do the same thing. Now, what's... What's, what's interesting to me in, in my conversations with missionaries very often, especially those pushing towards other kinds of rapid uh, multiplying movement type of work, is very often those people are wonderfully zealous and pious before the Lord. True. And they're like, they're looking at the American church and they're thinking, this is kind of weak and anemic and we mm -hmm. want something more radical. And so they wonderfully give themselves over to that kind of radical follow Jesus, though it cost mm -hmm. me everything sort of lifestyle. That's great. Mm -hmm. But the problem is they still haven't been trained in understanding what the church is. Mm -hmm. And the fact that raising churches is kind of like raising children. How long does that take? Quite a while. I got, I got teenagers. It's slow, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of factors going on here, I think, looking back at both just the American context and what we've grown up inside of, as well as the training we've received and the ecclesiology we've received. received. And especially the thing I want to highlight is that kind of short-term thinking. Mm. I mean, we could talk about multi-site and multi-services and all that and say that's more short-term thinking. Mm. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's a lot of 
lot of consequences in our American practices that come out of that kind of individualistic, short-term, pragmatic thinking, and the missions field, too. Yeah. Give me, okay, so Nine Marks guy, you guys focus on the church. You're big on the church. Let's put the missions to the side. Well, we're big on Christianity. (laughs) True. Which looks like the church. Good catch. (laughs) Helpful, very helpful. Okay, give me two or three things four or five, if you want to get into them. The church, downstream from the church, we always say, from your theology will flow your missiology. Yeah, that's From your church will flow your missionaries. Yeah, yeah, your missiology is coming out of your ecclesiology, coming out of your missiology. So what are the things that you're seeing in the evangelical world today, in the Protestant evangelical world, that are down or that are upstream from missions that you would say this is probably affecting this these are some of the pragmatic things these are some of the speed oriented things the things that will trickle down to the finishing the task let's get this done let's go really quickly what are those things in the church today that are kind of like hallmark things you would go yeah that probably affects that yeah sure in some ways uh, these, the, these are the very things I've been talking about with that kind of individualism and consumerism and attractionalism and pragmatism, which, mm. which then impacts how we do missions work. Uh, let me, in, in, in your talk of urgency and speed, let me, let me, let me talk about mm. s- several, highlight several things. Theologically, I, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's a deficient understanding of the gospel, mm. a thin view of the gospel, kind of an easy believism gospel, uh-huh. a thin view of conversion. So Jesus is Savior, Once saved, always saved, Mm. as opposed to Jesus is Lord and Savior, and um, those who will be saved will be will those who are saved will endure to the end. A doctrine of perseverance, right? An understanding of repentance and Mm. faith—not just believe, but repent and believe. If I have an anemic understanding of the word I'm declaring, of the gospel I'm declaring, yeah, that's going to show itself in a weak thin, anemic people might be being saved sometimes, sometimes not, mm-hmm. but I'm calling them believers too quickly because I don't have a strong gospel. Mm. I think that's a problem. That's downstream that shows up in missions. I think uh, a de-emphasis on the church and the role of the church as the means and ends of missions, mm. but instead an emphasis on movements, a movement of God and the Spirit, mm. Uh, uh, you know, kind of this rapid multiplying movement. We rely on movements taking off. What's going on there? Yeah. Well, neo-evangelicalism, at least since the 1950s and uh, and kind of continuing into this day, we're, we're very movement-oriented. Why? Well, we, we, cause, because we, we love to see people saved. Mm-hmm. We want to see dramatic movements of the Spirit. We're, we're, we're children of the first and second great awakenings in some mm-hmm. respects. Right? We, we want to see the masses coming to Christ, and that's awesome, yep. you see? And so we're looking for something special from God that we can see with our eyes. Yep. The idea of a slow, plodding, ordinary means of grace, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, see the Bible, read the, in the ordinances, read the Bible. Oh, that's just, that's hard to do. Because growth comes slowly, that plant slowly growing, those children slowly growing in the mm. faith. We want something not ordinary, we want something extraordinary. Mm. That's just in our DNA. So we start saying, okay, how do we cultivate a movement? What do I need to do? What processes created those great revivals of the mm. of the 19th, 18th, and 19th century? What what steps can I take to re-engineer? those same explosions and mm. we go back and we study the history of revivals and we, we try to reduplicate that and you see that in all sorts of ways you know 1950s 60s 70s churches you would see that in the altar calls and those sorts of things today i remember i got to malaysia and uh, some some missionaries picked me up and i was going to go teach uh, some 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 seminarians at malaysian baptist seminary there and the, the missionary a sweet guy picked me up and driving me from the airport was telling me about what was going on in Kuala Lumpur and all of that and he started talking about the tipping point and if we can only reach the tipping point Mm -hmm. of conversions here in KL then then we'll see mass things really start to happen reaching that tipping point is 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 crucial sort of movement language Mm. what's going on there well what's going on is ironically a, a more sociologically sophisticated version 
of Charles Finney's old mourner's bench. What, what, what is Finney preaching for in the mourner's bench? He's, he's using the powers of psychology mm -hmm. and the powers of the people around you to feel compelled to come forward and to you know, profess the name. And so I'm not just relying on the word and the spirit. I'm, I'm relying, as it were, on the powers of psychology mm. at that point. Okay, what is tipping point language? In a certain respect, it's the same thing, yep. albeit sociologically rendered now. Yep. If we get 11%, 12% of New York City coming to a saving knowledge of Christ, well, then, then everything will start to flow mm. as if the Holy Spirit is dependent on that, and that's what we're to be looking for. The Bible doesn't talk that way. Yeah. The Bible just doesn't talk that way. It talks about preach the word, in season and out of season. Mm. Right? It's out of season. I don't care. Preach the word. It's in season. Great. Preach the word, mm. you see. Um, so I, I see a lot of that movement not church-centered, not ordinary means of grace-centered, but movement, powers of psychology and sociology and culture-centered approach to making disciples. Now, God does work wonderfully sometimes in movements, but we don't have control over that. The Spirit yeah. does. Let Him do as He will. I plant, Paulus waters. We'll let the Lord give growth ordinarily or extraordinarily as He will. We can pray for it. Great. But beyond that, it's over to Him. I think that's another downstream problem. Um, I've been giving you a longer answer than you asked for. So. No, no, no. Helpful. Very helpful. Okay, so we've kind of hit a little bit around it. The coin of the realm, uh -huh. the, the head and shoulders, will say at Radius, just based off of the churches and the agencies that interact with us, 80%, 85%, some will say 90% of practices being done overseas are either four fields, Disciple making movements, DMM, yeah, yeah. or church planting movements, CPM. Sometimes yeah. it'll come in other flavors, rapid yeah. uh, church planting, short cycle church planting, T for T, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Have you heard of those? Yeah, I have. I've begun looking into them, begun reading into those things. I wouldn't say I feel like a large degree of professional competence in such mm -hmm. matters. Uh, but from what I can tell, as you say, that's the coin of the realm. In, in some ways, it's just like what Nine Marks has been talking about just in churches in America for the last 20 years. Mm. 70, 80, 90% are pragmatic, consumeristic. Mm. So it wouldn't surprise me that the people growing up out of those same churches, whether as writers on mission books or missionaries themselves, demonstrate a similar percentage, right, mm. in terms of what their instincts have been formed by. Yeah, It's, the, it's those same sorts of things. Um, my impression is that there are better and worse versions of it. True. Those that are a little bit more biblical and faithful and those that are less mm. in different agencies. Mm -hmm. Best I can tell, some are a little better. Some are a little bit more naive to the problems that they're, they're engendering, right, uh, with, with those types of things. So I, I don't want to come across as just offering a blanket indictment to everybody who has any association with movement center. Th Again, there's better and worse versions. If, if, if you're somebody who finds yourself and that's what you're promoting, I, I would encourage you to stop and take a look again at the Bible and maybe some of the critiques Nine Marks has been beginning to offer here and there mm -hmm. and the resources that we hope to be coming out with in, in, in future years and, and ask yourself, are, am, am I a better or a worse version? Even if you're the better version, you should have an interest in figuring out what makes this go wrongly. Yeah. And how can you fix, be more biblical in the, the, the things that are going on? In the same way, you're going to have more pragmatic and less pragmatic American churches. Mm. Right? I think there's a lack of... I think a lot of these people, so in the better versions, they're working to plant churches. Mm -hmm. And they're working to look at the Bible. True. And I appreciate that. Uh, I, I guess I would have questions from time to time in, in conversion. I'm a right understanding of conversion. God is sovereign. We're responsible. We have to understand both each for its part. Mm. People are called to repent and believe, be baptized into a Lord's Supper receiving church, become members of it as led by elders. So I think people, in the better versions of, of movement-driven methodology, there, there is an affirmation of those things. Yep. I would want to have further conversations, kind of the what do you mean? What does that look like? Exactly. If your version of that is a couple of two people who have, uh, let me give you a verse, a disciple making movement, you know, these people aren't even professing Christ yet, mm -hmm. but now they're leading Bible studies. Yeah. And in some crazy fashion, you're calling that a church. 
whoa, we got huge problems. Let's, let's turn the knob up and improve that slightly. Okay, you have a couple of young believers. Uh, they've not been discipled or trained, but they've made quick professions of faith because I've gone through a series of Bible studies with them. And now I'm leaving, behind, I'm leaving them behind and I'm telling them to quickly plant other churches because I have this speed, urgency problem. Well, that's better than the first situation. Yep. I appreciate that. But I still want to say, how long, a conversation you and I were having just even mm. yesterday, Brooks, about where are they going to be in 10 years? Mm. So when they hear Benny Hinn or Joyce Myers coming in over the radio, right, and they hear that, will they think, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Have you placed the antibodies into their system that they would recognize the problem with Joyce Myers or Benny Hinn mm-hmm. coming in or other versions of it just even from their own context? Yeah. In 10 years, are they going to look just like Benny Hinn or are they going to be strong, healthy churches? This goes back to the short-term thing yep. I was talking about. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's where I want to, I want to, I'd, I'd be wanting to push the conversation forward with some of the brothers and sisters who have a, even the healthier versions mm. of, of a church planning movement yeah. and, and something worth exploring. We have at Radius talked often about the report card for these churches are, number one, do they exist in five years? Like, you yeah. plan a church, right. we've got a movement, we've planted 12 churches, let's say, in three years. How many exist in five years? Yeah. What about seven years? What yeah. about 10 years? And let's see what they believe, what do they hold to? That's what I'm afraid of. The track record... Yeah. May not be good. I, yep, we'll see. God in his grace will measure all these things. Well, the question I want to ask is just, uh, if you're planning 12 churches in three years, wow, praise the Lord. But are you doing that in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Why would you have different expectations for Samarkand, Uzbekistan, or, you know, Sri Lanka, than you would for Tulsa, or Albuquerque, mm. or Baltimore. Nobody's planning churches that fast in American cities. cities. Mm. London. Well, why not? If it works well, there, over there, why didn't it work over here? Yeah. Well, because we, we kind of know better, frankly, over here. Everybody would say, yeah, that's nuts. Mm. But it's like the rules change over there. There's an ironic... There's the kind of... Uh, uh, what do you call it? The... Uh, the uh, unintended uh, racism, unintended prejudice of low expectations. True. There's an ethnocentrism. There's an ironic ethnocentrism, an ironic prejudice, an ironic, I don't want to say colonialism, but it's, it's something analogous it to that. It smacks of that. It does. Yep. Because it's expecting much less of these people over here than you would in your own country. True. That's where you can get ideas like orality. Well, right. they're an oral culture. Yeah, that's right. Let's not put the expectations on them. You're a Western guy. You're at, wait, wait, wait. Somewhere back in our timeline, somebody took the time to teach our ancestors how to read and write, and it became one of those codified things. So now we're going to give a lower form of this. We're well, you know what Sunday story. school started out of? Baptist recognizing we got to teach these kids to read so they can read the Bible. Mm. Let's do the hard work of teaching them to read yep. so they can read the Bible. Mm. Good point. And what's going to be better for the church in the long term when the Benny Hymns are piping in? True, true. People who can read their Bibles. Yep, exactly. To have the written word in your language. That's right. Nine Marks is, from what I hear, stepping into doing a series on missions. Why is that? Why do you think that's an evolution? I'm using the word evolution here. Why do you think that's a area? Why, why is that? happening in nine marks why would you guys want to step into hey, let's take a little bit of a stronger footprint a lot of the guys coming up through i've been blessed to meet with a handful of the pastors you got guys at different parts around the united states the guys in uae i was so incredibly blessed to go over there for the 50-year celebration of oh, that great. church yeah, and yeah, just yeah. to see John right, i wasn't there but i heard good things yeah oh my goodness and to see the guys that have come through the internship there and the churches that they've planted yeah. and so yeah, now yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. like grandkids coming off of this mama church so to speak right there in uae and just yeah why is this progression towards missions seemingly happening i mean you got the recent book no shortcut to success matt rhodes really really helpful resource now i'm hearing that there's probably going to be a series of books something church-centered missions yeah yeah why is that the case 
Well, because nine marks, as I have already said, is about Christianity. And Christianity is about making disciples. And making disciples is about churches. And churches are about missions, yeah. right? So our ecclesiology, our theology to our ecclesiology to our missiology. Mm. So it's, it's the natural evolution, if you want to use that word, that's fine. It's the natural next step for us to talk about. Mm. So we've been talking about healthy churches in the United States and the West for a long time, and to some extent around the world. But now we're wanting to um, think more deliberately and carefully uh, and help the missions community and churches sending missionaries community mm. to think about how part and parcel the churches and healthy churches with missions. Because we see... Uh, a deficiency in a lot of the literature. We see a lack of good thinking in those those uh, circles and in that domain. So our primary target with this series isn't so much the missionaries themselves mm -hmm. as it is the churches sending the missionaries. So we want to help the churches think well about missions yeah. so they equip their missionaries and aid and support and help their missionaries well. And then secondarily, yes, the missionaries who go yeah. think well about the crucial role that the church plays in their work. So, yeah, just kind of the next natural step hmm. of the things we've been talking about at Excellent. Nine Marks for the last two, three decades. Brother, um, I'm excited about it. I yeah. mean, I've heard snippets here and there of what's coming out with it. it. Sounds good. Give us two or three years. Yeah, for sure. Right now, pastor sees this in the next three weeks. Goes out in our newsletter and has a link. Jonathan Lehman's going to talk about missions. He's down in Radies. Um, what would be books that you would recommend that, okay, pastors have three or four couples kind of coming through the pipeline. We see them as, yeah, probably going to go plant churches globally, going to go to places where there are no churches, going to go to places where there's very limited churches. Like, what are some good books that they should, apart from the Bible, as my dear friend Mark Dever, who will read the Bible? Yes, agree. What are some other resources that you would say, hey, read this because it will help you kind of get a little bit of a course correction on maybe some of that 80 70 90 percent dna that's out there or it'll just give you a good grounding in some basic stuff that you need to have before you head to the field yeah a church is constituting two steps preaching of the word preaching of the truth preaching of the gospel mm -hmm. and then the binding together of those churches yeah. right through the ordinances and membership and discipline so you, you need books on both of those things or to borrow from mark, mark dever again uh, the, the, the word of light is, is like, life is like is like the water coming out of the fountain, mm -hmm. and then the church is the bowl that captures that water and holds it up and puts it on display, mm. right? So I, I want books, I want resources that are both about the water, as well as about the bowl yep. that's holding it up. You know, books on the water. I'm going to point to something like David Helm's expositional preaching, which is useful not just for preaching but for mm. Bible study and how do I explain the context, this text in its immediate context in the context of the Bible as a whole yeah. in a way that's applied to life today. So I, th I think that's a useful resource in that regard. A little um, sidetrack on that. What's mm -hmm. the best organization that helps teach expositional preaching? Simeon Trust. Simeon Trust. Charles Simeon Trust. Didn't have to lead you very far on that one. <laughs> Next no. book. Sorry. Well, nine marks. Mark number one is expositional preaching. They're like the double clicking on that. They're yeah. all expositional preaching, right? They're super helpful on that. Um, I think the book Michael Lawrence by Conversion. Okay, what is that word that's mm. going forth? What transformation do we expect to happen? And what's great about that book, he says, this is a book not just about conversion, but about the church. Yep. Why? We'll go back to the things I said at the beginning of this interview. We're converted into a family photograph. Exactly. Saved in a community. And and Michael Michael's book, Conversion, has a good understanding of saved into community as well as divine sovereignty, human responsibility. Mm. A right understanding of conversion is going to have both of those things and understand what that has to do with how we do build, plant, lead churches. Yep. Right? So, okay, there's there's the water coming out and the people being transformed, but then the bull... Um, You're not going to say it. Highlight church membership. This little blue book, it's got somebody's name on it. Lehman is the last one. Yeah, that's right. I think that's, I think that's helpful. Yeah. If you want something a little bit more robust... Okay. And vigorous yep. by me, uh, I would point to something like Don't Fire Your Church Members, yep. which is a kind of even more, it's an academic book, lots yeah. of footnotes. Defense of one main concept, what is it? Well, in some ways you might say it's elder-led congregationalism, Yeah. but even more than that, I want to say it's it's that bowl, what that bowl is. My book, One Assembly, is kind of doing the same thing. It's an argument for a single assembly, but more than that, yeah. it's an argument for what is a church. Mm. So if you're if you're a, again football coach, mm -hmm. you have to understand a football and what it is. Yeah. If you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to be a missionary, you 
got to understand that bowl. You've got to understand what a church is. And what's crazy, Brooks, is seminaries do a meh job of teaching it. True. So you're about to say something. I was about to say, so pastor, missionary, you would see those almost interchangeably. Without, let's take the cross-cultural stuff. They got to know how to learn languages. Got, but I mean, we've got we're talking about the same skill sets, same qualifications. True yes, or yes, not yes, true? yes, absolutely true. Okay, I can't imagine sending a missionary who's not elder qualified. Yeah, and including able to teach. Correct. Uh, the, the difference is, you know, I, I can I can envision sending, uh, uh, say, a, a single or married female yep. seminary, yep. and I wouldn't say they are elder qualified in that one respect. Right. Uh, so in that sense, I'm not going to equate missionary with pastor precisely because I'm going to send female missionaries. But this is where I love the Simeon Trust guys because when they come down, they teach our men and they bring women to teach our women because you get to an Islamic for environment. Women teaching our women, women have got to get up and teach no, in front exactly of women. Right. And so we need our that's women exactly to be able right. to teach as well. So you you know more about this brother than I do. You spent 13 years in Papua New Guinea. I've not done that. I mean, I spent time overseas, even in missions context, but I've not lived it out in the way you have. So my understanding is there's going to be certain skills required of a missionary that Joe Pastor in, you know, Bumble's, yeah. Bumble's Street, Idaho Bumble. doesn't have to need to have. Yeah. But biblically, yes, yeah. they are they are approximants to one another. Good, good, good. Uh, things that excite you. We already talked about the Nine Marks World uh, the mission series coming out. What are things that you're like? Hey, this is kind of cool. This is happening in non English speaking circles happening overseas, and even English-speaking schools. Again, the whole trip to UAE was such an eye-opener for me. One, the UAE is such a strange Weird. environment. I mean, it's like an anomaly. Exotic, yeah. crazy, It's like fascinating. Nina and I, all we could say is it's like Las Vegas in the Middle East. <laughs> I like, know. It's just kind of crazy. It is nuts. So, but to see a good gospel-preaching church happening there and to see the fruit of that coming mm -hmm. out was just, yeah, it was so mm -hmm. encouraging other things happening in the Nine Marks world that you would be encouraged about that would be, hey, this is going global. This is happening on a scale outside of our environments, whether that's our culture or our language. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things about Nine Marks methodology and going global. Number one, uh, we want to rely on churches. So we are reluctant to go into a place unless there is an on-the-ground pastor and church. Mm. Um, uh who we are on board with yeah. and uh, and rely on him and his wisdom or those churches, that network in, say, India or, or Kuala Lumpur or, or, or wherever to be doing that work. Um, number two, it doesn't. they don't need to carry our brand. We're not yeah. looking to put the IX logo up everywhere, yeah. in, you know, in the blue collar. You know, it's like, use our name, don't use our name, whatever, we don't care. Um, and so what's encouraging, what's exciting for us is to watch more and more we call them hub churches around the planet, different places, capture this vision of what the Bible says a church should mm -hmm. be and translating that material. So if you go to ninemarks.org, click on books or publication books, I think, and you click on translations, we yep. just have more and more translations showing up all over the place. So recently, Colin Hans and I wrote a book called Rediscover Church. It's already been put into 20 different languages, mm. right? And and that that's kind of typical. So we we have translations going into all of these different, and we leave it to the, our partners on the ground to figure out how to best do this and what maybe adjustments that need to be made for that context. That's that's encouraging. Uh, I just recently taught a, an ecclesiology class, a full ecclesiology class at Western, that Western Seminary in Portland that we we videoed, and we have a group in China that is gonna, I don't know if they're gonna dub it or I think they're gonna dub it into Mandarin. Yeah. Oh wow. I think they're gonna dub it. And we'd like to see that in more and more places mm. to provide those sorts of resources around the world. We're doing a set of pastoral toolkits, we call them, mm. which basically means a series of articles and videos around one topic that, again, we hope will be translated yeah. and useful for people around the world. The first one we're doing is on elders, yeah. how to be elders in your context. One thing I, as a, the editorial director, am honest, always trying to think about is, how would this play out in a non-American, non-English context? I don't always do a good job of that, mm -hmm. but I'm at least trying to ask the question. And then with our translators and partners around the world, letting them go even further, yeah. and be like, okay, Jonathan, those, those illustrations you all used, just way too American. Right. You know, you talk about vacation Bible school or American football, it's just, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. And other stuff that, you know, you wouldn't even think of. Mm -hmm. um, Understanding that the world doesn't depend on nine marks. It depends yeah. on the Bible. So what are we doing to resource people around the world, not with nine marks, but with 
helping yeah. them think what the Bible says about the church. Well, brother, I mean, I've been so encouraged with just your guys' appetite to learn in the spirit of missions and just what Radius is about. Mark's been down here a few times with a handful of the other brothers that I trust so very much, and we've had our people graduate from here and end up helping out in different Nine Marks churches, going through internships, and just, yeah. it's been an encouraging path for us, Thank because you. it means Praise that the there's a learner's heart there, and that's a huge deal, yeah. so encouraged yeah. by that greatly. Um, let me hit one other hot button one, and then we'll jump Uh-oh. into some closers. Okay. Uh, prayer walks, really popular, kind of happening. I'm all for walking and praying. <laughs> I am too. What yeah. do you got against walking and praying, Brooks? Very little. The walking okay. sometimes, not so much, but yeah, the praying for sure. Um, but used as an evangelistic tool or starting to look at territorial spirits. There's even this thing, I, our friend Caleb Morrell has done a little more research on this, like uh, mapping of spirits and praying specifically for those types of spirits to be removed or to be disempowered or mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Thoughts on that? Just a general out there question because prayer walks are gaining in popularity and praying out the regional spirits yeah. of the area. Yeah. Thoughts on that? It's really hard to live by faith. We want to see stuff. Mm. We want quick fix, pragmatic steps to take that we think will help us see results. Mm. Plotting slowly, preaching the Bible, praying the Bible, seeing the Bible, the stuff the Bible actually emphasizes and talks about. Yeah. That requires faith because we so desperately want to see. Yeah. And that's a good desire. But just relying on what the Bible emphasizes, what does Paul emphasize? Does, does Paul, Peter, John, Jesus, they talk about prayer walks, mapping? Not that I've read. I mean, I know how those books go. I know how they work. Often somebody will grab a single text and like turn it into something. That, you know, I don't know, Jesus telling the demons to go into the pigs or, or, or maybe, you know, different angels in the book of Revelation. I mean, oh, maybe there's a corresponding demon. You know, okay. Yeah. Is, that, is that what Mark is trying to do when Jesus says go into the pigs? Mm. Or is it just showing Jesus' authority over the demons? Mm. Is that is that what, what John is trying to get at when he talks about the angel mm. in each of that? Oh, in fact, there's territorials. Yeah. You're, you're just making that up at this point. Yeah. And if it's there, I'm just not seeing it. Right. So I guess what I'd want to say is let's emphasize what the Bible emphasizes, mm. trusting the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to have revealed everything that's necessary for life and doctrine. Yeah. So I think what you have here in some way is a sufficiency of Scripture, mm. authority of Scripture, authority and sufficiency of Scripture problem. Mm. I think it's something additional, or maybe I'm grabbing something obscure from the Old Testament that shows up in one verse in Chronicles or Judges or whatever, and I'm taking that and I'm designing my entire evangelistic program mm. out of that one verse, Prayer of Jabez style, out of Chronicles, right? Now we have this massive industry of evangelicals going down. Just just read the New Testament. Read the Old Testament, yes. Right. But how we read the Old Testament through the New Testament in terms of what you're doing for your evangelistic ministry, your disciple-making ministries, it's just, it's just there. Yeah. What are they emphasizing? So all of that stuff, I'm afraid it's a distraction. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid it's 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 um, potentially pa- uh, tapping into understandable impulses to see, but not faith-driven impulses mm-hmm. to trust what the Bible says. Yeah, true, true. You've been down here, got to spend a night, got to hang out, go get some tacos, tacos. with the students last night. It was awesome. It was so great. Loved it. <laughs> and you were crazy. You are, I was telling the students, you're the first guy from the Nine March world to bring his wife. And she, Am I? Yeah. Like, oh. we haven't had anybody else bring their wives down. Maybe She's was... been energized by seeing the Fellowship and the Fire for, got three Fs, Fellowship and Fire for, uh, I can't think of another F, <laughs> for, for, so for, for the gospel <laughs> uh, among these students. It's been really encouraging. Good, good, good. Thoughts on Radius? Just pastor, hey, I know Jonathan, I don't know Radius, what would you say? What's it about? What Would it, would it be helpful for pastors in certain realms if they think that they're thinking about sending their people to the field? Crucial, awesome, wonderful. That was How's that? Yeah, that was definitely not three Fs, but it was... Okay, uh, crucial, awesome, wonderful. Here's, here's why. 
and I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going on based on a, a, an evening of conversations with students, what I know you're committed to just from our, our larger relationship, what I know you're committed to, but then just on the ground, an evening of conversations with students yeah. and the kind of questions that were coming back to me in, in class today as well as a breakfast time conversation. What, what am I hearing? What am I seeing? I'm, I'm seeing students who recognize uh, because they've been living inside of a other cultural environment and experiencing the the challenges of that, of, of making relationships with local business owners and sharing the gospel with folk like that and relying on them for certain things and the exercises that you, you give to them, who uh, are seeing both the challenges of placing yourself in an unfamiliar overseas context, but also what was interesting to me is they were all, it's like they were reading from a similar script mm. about what missions is. And part of me wants to say, oh, well, if churches were doing their jobs and seminaries were doing their jobs, Radius wouldn't have to exist. I don't know if that's true. Mm -hmm. I do feel like you guys are offering a unique value added. In some sense, teaching what good theology is and what good ecclesiology is and even what good missiology is doesn't need Radius, formally speaking, but because so many churches and so many seminaries aren't teaching those things, it needs radius. Mm -hmm. But even more, that embeddedness and in living inside of a fellowship, a community of people who are sharing that, I think is dramatically impacting, shaping their, their not just them at the formal principle level, but almost at an intuitional instinct mm -hmm. level uh, about what does it take to go overseas mm -hmm. to an unreached, unengaged language group mm -hmm. situation and plant, make disciples and plant churches there. Mm. Um, and my expectation is, is you are raising, equipping, building people up for the long haul. Mm. Not just show up for two, three, four, five years is so often the case in people returning. Yep. But they're there for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. True. That's hard. Mm. Let's go back to that whole short-term versus long-term conversation. So much missions work is preparing people for short term. And by short term, I don't mean two weeks. I mean two years, three years, four years, yep. five years. That kind of mission work. Where it's clear to me, you guys are preparing them for the long haul. True. And giving them right ecclesial and missiological instincts, intuitions, principles as well about how to do that. And forming them in a communal context, which is so powerful. Mm. So, yeah, I would highly encourage. I'd highly encourage pastors to come take a look at this and think about it. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you're catching them on the final two weeks oh, of yeah, their yeah, nine-month yeah, yeah, yeah. journey. And yeah, they are, it's just, it's so encouraging. It's the reason my wife and I came here was to impact the nations through pouring into these 50, 60, 70 every year. It's and awesome. I hope guys, you stay. I hope you keep doing it. It's evidently fruitful. Yeah. It's encouraging on a variety of levels. Thanks for making the trip down. Yeah, sure. Appreciate you having love the to conversation. Come back. We'd love to have you back. Thanks, brother. Thanks.